if you're listening in, a piece of the context that you might not have is that what Juliana does is she helps digital marketing agencies scale through the $1 million, $3 million, $7 million plateaus. And so if you're a consultant that's not yet at those plateaus or you're trying to get past them, like everything here is tested because again, it's, it's been done with like over 200 plus agencies, right? And so that just really underlies the importance of what it is that we're sharing. Wait, did you say 500? Yeah, yeah, we've we've gone up since our marketing materials. <laughs> I don't have words. I'm a words guy and I don't have words. Picture this, you graduate from Columbia University, you've got a background in finance, so of course you decide to work in the financial capital of the world, Wall Street, New York. However, you very quickly learn that it is also the burnout capital of the world, so then you leave. What do you do? You go and work in the sports and entertainment industry where every six to eight weeks you are flown to a new city where you now have a budget of $1 million per week to then build up a team of 50 to 70 people from scratch to hire up to 100 people per day every six to eight weeks. After that, you decide to start a company called Scale Time. We're you help scale 500 digital marketing agencies. That's the story of Juliana Marolando. And I have the pleasure of having her as today's guest on The Modern Consultant. If you've wondered what it takes to scale, no matter what industry you are in, particularly if you happen to be a consultant or service provider, this is going to be the episode for you. We talk about why consulting is one of the hardest business models to scale and what you need to do and how you need to even think about it to be able to scale. We also talk about different ways to scale, scaling with a team versus productizing your services. We also talk about working one-on-one versus group program models, cohort-based models, and everything in between. If you've been thinking about how to productize your expertise in a way without sacrificing the quality of client outcomes, then tune in. Thank you for listening. And with that, let's get right into it. For someone who has yet to meet you, I think the best way for us to get started is for you to tell a story. And because we learn the most, I think, about people when we hear them talk about someone else, you know, uh, we get to know their values and just everything. And that's why we need to talk about Mojo because Mojo is basically a person. And I want for you to tell us who Mojo is and how Mojo got into your life so mojo is a 15 pound brat (laughs) that walks around um like she owns the place and then has frequent size during the day like she's got rent to pay little freeloader so (laughs) i um my dog mojo i i got my so my I've had dogs now for, for the better part of my adult life. Um, and my dog Kia had passed away um, in basically retirement. So she ended up going to Columbia with my mom, um, you know, where my mom was like starting to feed her fettuccine with like a fork. Like it was, it, Living it a good was, life. yeah, she's, she retired well. Um, <laughs> and so, uh, you know, and I hadn't had a dog for quite some time. And then she passed away and, and I didn't want to like get a dog, you know, while my other dog that I wasn't living with, like was still alive. Cause I, <laughs> with, I don't know, some morbid sense of loyalty. Like I just couldn't bring myself to do it. So when she had passed away, um, I felt like, okay. I mean, you know, I grieved Kia, which I loved very much. And then I went and got Mojo. And it was, it was very like I had been researching all sorts of dogs because Kia had had a lot of personality. So she was a Jack Russell. She was insane. Uh, I really respected her though, like and her insanity, (laughs) but she was insane. Um, And like, I was like, no, no, I I want a better behaved dog. Right. Um, One that I can like train from the bottom up because Kia was a rescue. And, um, and so I ended up doing all this research for like six months, uh, landed on a Boston Terrier, um, had the name like four months before I got her. I was like, I'm going to call it Mojo. Um, you know, she's going to live up to her name. Uh, and yes, she does. And we, we were going to go and pick her up in Pennsylvania. 
Um, and we were going to drive there. And my friend, Sonny, who was studying at the time for his flight license. And I think he had reached like a hundred miles, like in the air. Mm-hmm. And he's like, Hey, do you want to come? Um, I was like, we can take a plane. Cause my car is in the shop. And, and I had, I had flown with him before. And, you know, I mean, it was, it was good, but if you've ever been with someone who's like getting a driver's license, like in the ground, it's kind of same thing, but you're in the air. So <laughs> You're like, please don't make a U-turn into like incoming traffic, but in the air. And and so we went and we go picked up Mojo and she came back and she's just amazing. She's like, you know, all full of dopamine and serotonin all day long. That is her job. Um, job. And she's (laughs) she's the cutest thing. So just to recap, you took a private plane to go pick up the boston terrier for the first time is that is that am i tracking on that yes yes okay. yes, yes you are tracking on that <laughs> oh man um, and, and thank you for telling me about the video there yes mm-hmm. and and it wasn't like you know like your instagram like oh super posh you know with our louis vuitton you know we're getting no no we're talking about like a rinky dink like 1960s you know the thing is like scotch taped together <laughs> we're like crossing our fingers that it's not gonna crash um but i i have a lot of trust in uh my best friend mm-hmm. and a lot of trust you know that he was not gonna let us die mm-hmm. um but it was it was great just for the context of somebody who might be listening to this and of course they can't even like see it. So like how many people does this plane seat? Um, I think it's less cargo space than like a Volkswagen Beetle. Like (laughs) it's like two in the front, two in the back. And you're like, you're like, you're, you're in sardine land at that point. You're, it is tight. It is cozy. So that is amazing. Um, you tell the best stories. And what is also really unique uh, to me about this is actually what happens next. Because you created a learning plan for Mojo. Tell us about that. Oh, yeah, yeah. We had, um, we had a 16 onboarding, 16-week onboarding for Mojo. We had a learning plan. Um, so before I had gotten Mojo, uh, I was like, all right, I'm going to get as many resources as I possibly can. Right. So, um, you know, everything with like, you know, obedience training, um, you know, fun tricks, uh, all the things that I could possibly think of, um, because I was like, all right, I'm going to do this right. The first time, um, leash training, walking, like, right. Mm-hmm. And so like, it was like week one. She's going to learn her name and sit week two. uh, She's going to learn to stay and she's going to learn to roll week three. Right. And so, and it was a very dedicated plan. Um, My, (laughs) my boyfriend at the time was like, you're insane. And I was like, yes, I am. And I have zero qualms about it. Um, And, you know, and, and he was actually like, more into the training that I was at that point. So I don't know what he was talking about. Um, And in the evenings, uh, you know, we would have like trainings. And and so we would practice and then we practice all day, you know, and we made sure that we were like feeding her with our hands so that she like basically got very food motivated and she is. Um, And it's, it's amazing. Like she did really well. She, yes. the the reason why I'm, I'm i'm jumping in here right is because i can almost hear someone that's like listening to this and they're like thinking to themselves like okay yeah we're talking about dogs but like we came to like learn about like digital ops no there, there's gonna be a time this is, this is all coming like full circle um and part of it that really impressed me about how you went about it was how intentional you were with the training and there's context in here that someone who's listening just would not have, which is you actually have a deep background in not just psychology, but also personal development and ergo basically uh, human behavior change, you know? And in addition to that, you also have this really cool background uh, working 
you know, on Wall Street and finance before you even got to uh, operations, which requires you to be good at human behavior if you ever hope to have anything be implemented. And so, like, all <laughs> of that's like bubbling around in my head and being applied to the training of this uh, 15 pound Boston Terrier. So, question for you is how would you say? that your background in psychology has influenced the way that you look at digital operations? I would say that so much of operations, um, when people think about operations, right? It's mm -hmm. like, okay, well, we've got process, we've got profit, we've got workflows and checklists and technology and automation, um, and now AI, right? Like there's, there's all these things right and objects if it and we're trying to make the thing work, right we're trying to make the thing into a system and we're trying to make the systems you know output our desired outcomes right we're like okay here's what we want how do we get there how do we get there consistently repeatedly profitably and then there's this one thing this one teeny tiny thing that sometimes people forget is that human gonna human right like people they are do. the greatest margin of error <laughs> in the process of the operations right mm -hmm. and for service-based businesses right especially like if you're a consultant and you're trying to grow a consulting model which is one of the hardest models to grow because it's all full mm -hmm. and so where human behavior gets into it is that I often say, you know, I mean, you can create a great workflow, right? You're like, here's the process. You're like, ooh, it works. I got it down. I mean, I was writing an SOP this morning. Um, I was like, it's going to be awesome. And then it turns out that you have to hand it over to a person to do it, right? Um, now you can hand it over partially to technology. You could hand it over to an automation, but even behind that, there's going to be a human that needs the quality control. Right. And there's nothing like when Zapier, you know, ends up like losing a link and then your automation doesn't work. And then you have humans that don't know how to go in and fix it because they don't fully understand it. So in, before you actually get a process, I often say there's habit before process mm. because we need to have humans create the habit, especially if it's a new process, right? Or even if it's an adjustment to an old process, right? There's, there's a new habit, a new behavior that needs to be bought into, adopted, and then hopefully owned. I really like that habit before process. Like I, that my, my mind made an instant mental note. Like once you said that, um, because again, just like you said, like humans are going to be doing this. And if what you're hoping for is improved performance, then that's not going to happen. If the human also doesn't have the habit of doing the thing that needs to be done in the way that it needs to be done. And so then the process becomes irrelevant. Uh, if the process is not done, um, either at the rate that it needs to be done or to the level of quality, so on and so forth. There's also another thing that you said in there that was actually really interesting to me is that consulting is actually one of the hardest models to run because one of the prevailing um, you know, thought threads out there is that if you want to start um, a business, then you should start a service-based business. And ergo, usually the recommendation is some consulting of uh, some uh, kind. Um, but then it sounds like you might be saying that, well, at least this is what I'm just putting together. You can tell mm -hmm. me um, uh, if it checks out on your end. Consulting might be easier to start, but it's hardest to scale. Would you agree with that? Distinctions? Absolutely. Anything? Yeah, absolutely. Because the the reason why it's so easy to start in theory, right, um, is because it's a low barrier to entry. Like you don't need a lot of tech. You don't need a lot of overhead, right? Especially if it's just you, if, you know, um, in the beginning, you're monetizing your expertise, right? Like, well, you're selling and then monetizing and delivering on your expertise, which is what makes consulting so relatively easy to begin with as, as a business. Now it's really hard because now you've got to teach others that expertise, right? Mm -hmm. And so how do we then scale what you initially started with? Um, and that's 
hard. Um, it's hard work. It's, it is. I know from firsthand experience <laughs> and <laughs> that part that you said that just really encapsulates it. You know, the, okay, you spent all these years developing your own personal expertise, but then you know, it's like you can you could really scale like two ways. You can need you know systems, people, or usually some combination of both. You know, um, mm-hmm. and you know, and we'll we'll get into the robots and AI and like where all that fits in later on. But it's it is hard, you know, and I don't think people have enough of an appreciation for what the growth journey looks like, uh, and thinking through what the evolution of the business model might look like to be able to live the kind of life that they want. Now, one of the taglines that I know that you have is, you know, removing, you know, the data, removing uh, the the founder or owner, you know, from the day-to-day grind so that they can, you know, spend more time in the sunshine, right? (laughs) And my question then is, what would you expect to be some of the common challenges that consultants might face, you know, as they're trying to scale up and what recommendations might you have for them? Yeah, I think one of the common challenges is, you know, in the very beginning, I think this is something for for everyone. Um, It's just letting things go, right? Mm -hmm. Because as a consultant, right? Like if you're starting off as the primary, you're basically doing everything. Um, And then if you have any children, it's like that frozen song, let it go, let it go. <laughs> um, and, and a lot of things that you can let go of are um, organizational administrative, right? Like, mm-hmm. you know, step one, get a bookkeeper. Do not do your books by yourself. It is not worth your time. Even if you're a financial consultant, you're like, I can do my book. It's still not worth your time. Um, you know, and then any sort of, you know, get a VA, get, get some sort of operations help just because that's going to be the easiest thing that's going to increase your capacity to be able to take on more clients, right? Mm -hmm. And whether that is one-on-one clients or one-to-many clients, depending on what level of consulting you are, um, like you now, especially if you are in a place where you're trading time for money, um, you want to increase as much time as possible to make more money, Mm -hmm. right? And uh, you, you know, and Obviously, right? Like you can increase that and incre- increase prices, which is a whole other jam. Mm-hmm. But I think that's one of the biggest things is just increasing your capacity, right? So that you can go from feeling like you're busting at the seams with five clients to be able to take on 10 clients and you're good. So, so please continue. No, I was going to say, like, that's like the, at the first part of the maturity level. And then the second piece is figuring out how you want to scale. Because um, there's so many different ways to figure out how are you going to then monetize this expertise, right? Like, are you going to, you know, have other consultants that do what you do, um, but are doing it at a lesser price point? Are you, you know, so that you're coming in as, as the big consultant, um, are you going to then productize your expertise into workshops or courses? Um, you know, are you going to take your expertise and then go into product development? So there's just so many different ways to scale. And oftentimes I don't, think that consultants thoroughly think through that of mm-hmm. like, how do I want to do this? What are my options? Um, because there, there is a bit of like one-on-one consulting fatigue that happens. Yeah, absolutely. I have seen that uh, with some of my past clients where they, uh, some of them, th- the way that it comes up is I'm thinking about going back to corporate. You know, and, you know, for clarity's sake, you know, primarily I work, you know, independent consultants, you know, um, and, and so then they're thinking about, you know, going back to corporate, you know, or they might be down the path of productizing their expertise and thinking back to just going back to one-on-one done for you services. Basically there's a, when things get hard, let me go back to uh, the devil I know, you know, so to speak. You know, let me go back to what it was that I was doing before. Uh, I have familiarity with that. I think I have more control or more influence uh, over that. 
question for you is what do you think is missing, if anything? Is there anything that a consultant might need to consider before they think about what kind of business model um, they should be pursuing to be able to continue to grow? I think for consultants, it's um, just thinking through, like, how do you want to spend your day? You know, I mean, and this goes for anybody, right? Like consultant or not, like, how do you want to spend your day? What do you want to learn? Um, you know, what are you willing to learn? And to, to shift into a new model, right? So if you're going to go into a group model, it's like, you know, our, you know, learning sort of group dynamics, facilitation. Um, so many people, are, you know, they preach like, oh, you know, instead of doing one-to-one, do one-to-many, but there's there's a lot of things that go into one-to-many yep. um, that can make it quickly retract, right? And you're like, oh, that didn't work. Uh, let me go back to one-to-one. Um, if you're going to go into like, you know, course creation, um, are you willing to think through your expertise um, and now think through curriculum, right? Because because mm-hmm. you're going to take what you know and then transform that into things that are digestible, um, into things that are memorable, right? Because you might in one on one, and whether that's individual one on one, small business, or one on one corporate, right? Like if you're, um, like you might know how to make an impact, but can your impact then have a ripple effect where someone can on demand take your knowledge and then implement it? So there's there's a growth to extending yourself beyond the business model you know. And I think it's like, what do you want to learn and what are you willing to learn? I think that's so really important. I 100% agree. I think it's really important. And it also makes me think about your own business model. Um, you at one point um, had transitioned away from one-on-one uh, client work. Um, mm-hmm. Why? Why? When did it happen? Why did it happen? And what did you transition to? How did you make that decision? Yeah. So for like three years, um, and I think this was. So I transitioned. In 1999, so that was four years ago. Um, three years prior, people kept telling me you should build a course, and this is like when courses just started to get hot. Like, I mean, even like before they started to get hot, right? Like when they were just, you know, and they were like, "Yeah, you should build a course. You should build a course." And I was, for me, right in operations because so much of it is implementation. Um, for operations, so much of it is implementation, and I was like a three percent completion rate is it going to do it for me like i don't like those results and 3% is usually what you know courses are and for certain industries right and cert- certain niches like that 3% of like if someone gets one thing that changes their entire business or their entire life it's worth it right mm-hmm. like it's totally worth it so it's not a knock on courses it's just that like my philosophy i'm like your results are my results and i need you to implement um it was like, I don't need you to watch like training. I need you to implement. So I just I couldn't, couldn't transition. I couldn't do it. I could because I didn't believe in the business model. Mm-hmm. Um, finally, I had someone who, you know, who was like, all right, let's think through this. Like, what are the outcomes you want people to have? What do you need? Right. And he's like, well, why don't you build a hybrid model? He's like, why don't you build something where there is training? you know, and then you have like a live component, you're helping with implementation. I was like, okay. So I started tinkering with that idea. Mm -hmm. I actually ended up um, facilitating and training in other people's courses. And, and I was like, okay, I can make a huge impact like this with one to many. So I got really comfortable with one to many. And that was part of my own mental paradigm shift. Mm -hmm. And I created something that you know, had training for teams. I wanted something that was a team model so that, you know, I was like, okay, well, the owners really aren't going to watch any sort of course or training because they don't have time. Um, 
So I was like, who is, I was like team members. So I was like, all right, let's, let's create something that is, that is for the team itself. Um, how do we increase the performance? What is the live component? What's the implementation component? So I ended up creating something that was more holistic that I believed in. That's incredible. And also a testimony to your values, you know, of not just integrity, but also quality, you know, and being performance driven for the right reasons, you know, because at the end of the day, if somebody doesn't actually implement the thing, then they don't get the outcome. And then you aren't able to fulfill the promise of being able to create more freedom for um, digital agency owners, you know, in their lives, you know? So I think that's incredible. And I've, I've seen you do it uh, time and time again. And so now let's see, even zoom forward, you know, uh, a little bit more because that's just one of the programs, you know, that you created a hybrid model. Um, but something else that you did is you are no longer the only person that is, you know, uh, consulting. You know, you you have a team of consultants. You know, how did you come to that? Why did you come to that? Um, as opposed to say remaining the solo consultant and just kind of like you know scaling your time that way. Uh, yeah, tell us more about that. So, the truth of the matter is, the pandemic happened, and I was stuck in my house, and I could no longer travel. Um, so like, I would love to give you a story of like, yeah, this was the impetus of blah, 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 blah. No, no. Um, so I'm a huge traveler. Um, anyone who knows me, know, you know, I've been to over 30 countries and, you know, I'm like, love being on planes, whether they're rickety or first class, right? Like love planes. And I, I, I couldn't go anywhere. <laughs> um, and so I was like, oh. Yeah, what am I going to do? And then I was like, yeah, I think we should scale this thing. Right. Um, and, and I had thought about, you know, like how I wanted to scale. Right. So I went through my own journey, like, how do I want to scale and what do I want to do? And, you know, and for me was, I, I had tested this group model, right. Like this, this ecosystem of resources, small cohort model, it really worked. And I was like, okay, this, you know, um, this works. And like the results were great. Everything was great. You know, I was like, can we replicate it outside of myself? Right. Like, can I hire other people? And I had seen, <laughs> and I had seen group models really fail. Mm. Um, and so it was, it wasn't like I went into this lightheartedly and I was like, ah, oh. and like, and I knew like the things that had failed in other group models. And a lot of it was training. It was, you know, you have this expert, right? Like they know their stuff. Um, they, they know like exactly how to diagnose issues. They know how to look for the things that are not being said. I often call that the white space. Um, they know how to, you know, provide solutions that meet people where their resources and the maturity are at. Um, so you know, and then they like, they bring on either consultants or coaches and, and it flops, right. Mm -hmm. Quality goes down everything. So, um, so I was like, all right, what is the training that I need to create? What is the quality assurance that I need to create? Who are the people that I need to hire? You know, what are the capabilities I'm hiring for, um, to really be able to replicate this model. And that's what I did a lot during the, the pandemic was, mm. was that level of infrastructure. So I have so many follow-up questions, um, in response to this and also from two different perspectives, because in listening to the earlier, there's like two people who are listening to this, right? You have the folks who already have like a team of consultants that they're leading, you know, um, or they might not even refer to them as consultants. It might just be the creative team or whosoever, you know, and then you also have like the, the solo consultant, you know, they, they have some experience and been doing it for a couple of years. Uh, and they're thinking about evolving the model to like the next step. Right. And so from those two perspectives, some of the questions that I know are popping up for them are, Ooh, you said small cohort, how small, what is a cohort? Why a cohort? Let's start there. I have more. Okay. But yeah. Um, so 
when I was thinking through this hybrid model, I wanted to say, okay, um, for operations, right? Um, different from other subject matter expertise, right? Like I think that if you're doing marketing, you could do large groups um, and make a lot more money. <laughs> However, for operations, uh, so much of it is the implementation and also the feedback loops into different divisions, right? So it's like your client onboarding is going to affect your sales. It's going to affect your delivery. Um, your delivery, you make a change in your delivery. It's going to affect, right? So you've got this trickle effect that... Um, so for me, implementation was really big. And one of the things that I tested, and I really did test the business model in many different ways um, before I landed on something that I thought worked right and not thought like you know i was like this is the results we're tracking you know here are the benchmarks it's working and the cohort that i landed on that worked really well was small groups so we put people into small groups for 12 weeks in sort of our foundational program and we have basically teams of agencies because that's who we serve um where there are anywhere between two to four agencies in a small peer group. And that is what I call a cohort. And like how many people per agency might be on a call? Cause I'm trying to almost like sketch out like in someone's mind, you know, just like what kind of expectation could they possibly set for themselves as far as how many people could be helped on a call while achieving the objective that you shared, which is making sure that they have the level of support that they need to be able to implement and get the results. Yes. So, so if you're going for a small peer group model, right? Sometimes people will call it a squad model, a huddle model, a cohort model. Um, if people are following a linear path, um, you can serve anywhere between two to eight um, sets of teams, right? Whether it's an individual or team at a time. Um, why is that? Because in a linear path, what I mean by a linear path is um, if you are teaching someone, for example, um, how to create a course, right? And you're, and let's say you're on week X and that week is like, okay, we're going to create the outcomes that you want for this, right? And so you're going through some level of material. Everyone's in the same boat at the same time. Um, and if they're at the same level, right? Whether it's like brand new people um, who are creating a course for the very first time and you're teaching them how to do this, like you can, um, all the questions are gonna be exactly the same more or less, right? Especially after you do this a couple of times, um, people are going to be in the exact same maturity level with the exact same resources. So there's going to be a lot of things that are replicable. So you can take on more. Now for my particular groups, the reason why they're small is because people will come in at different entry points. And so some people will be dealing with the project management. Other people will be dealing with their client onboarding. Other people will be dealing with um, their account management, right? Mm -hmm. So we are dealing with, I try to keep the groups at the same maturity level so that the questions, so that they can learn from each other. Mm -hmm. Um, but there's, you know, what is called differential learning where people are going to come at us with different questions for different pain points at the same time. And so that's why we keep it small. And then we divide, um, the call by like hot seat, if it were, um, by team, right? So if there's three teams, everyone gets 20 minutes, mm -hmm. right? And how many people can be part of it? I cap it at three per team um, for two reasons. One, it's really weird if you have a group of one and a group of like 12 um, yeah. <laughs> from a meeting standpoint, like just the dynamics are just, they get weird. Also, it's not worth an owner's overhead to have that many people in a meeting, right? So from I protect your profitability, I don't want you to do that to yourself. So I cap it at three for those two, two reasons. I love that perspective on looking at it um, through the lens of also like 
cost, labor cost, the time um, yeah. that each person needs to be in on the meeting, and then who needs to actually be in on that meeting for efficiency purposes. Also paying attention to like the group dynamic. And so then the quality of the experience for everybody else that's on the call and stuff as well for to be able to maximize the learning outcomes. And of course, the awareness around, you know, just what everyone's going to need for their own learning uh, journey at that point in time as well. There's something else I want to dive into here. Um, that's an important oh, distinction. Yeah. Sorry. Can I just add something that I yes, think would please. be super helpful for consultants? Um, yeah. And I didn't mean to cut you off. No, so please. whether you're dealing with one-on-one or groups or teams, um, <laughs> there is something huge that I learned that saved me so much time, headache, um, and issues with perceived value is, and I'm going to drop a little, a little nugget here that I think would be really helpful, especially for consultants. Um, who is in these groups? Usually it's a decision maker and an implementer, right? Mm -hmm. So people yes. are like, well, who should be in there? Right. Right. Yep. One, because I want the person making the decisions to be able to do them with velocity. I want the person who is implementing to get what we are doing um, without too much, you know, game of telephone mm -hmm. um, so that they can go, we can train them up. So that's the composition. I, uh, sorry, it, go ahead, please. If a team is taking too long to make a decision, meaning like if they can't make a decision by the end of the call, right? And now our calls, right? So you figured, let's say someone on average has like 13 minutes to like go through something and we're doing it all with velocity. Um, they can't make a decision. Their homework is to make a decision, right? Like when I was doing one-on-one, -on -one, and this is for consultants, like... If a team wasn't making a decision within five minutes, and then like I'm sitting there, like I'm facilitating a freaking group thing, and I'm just like, oh my God, I want to kill you. Um, I'm like, okay, it goes into your action items. You are going to make this decision and we're moving on. Um, because the decision making of teams just took so much time that being able to do that effectively, whether it's with groups, one on ones, or teams, made a huge difference in being able to get them results, making them accountable and making them move faster. There's really, really, really like the distinction on decision-making speed and who needs to be there to be able to accelerate the velocity um, of decisions. Uh, because again, that's such a key, it's such a key thing. No one really talks about it. Um, and especially if you don't have the experience of those group dynamics, uh, you, you just won't even have the awareness until you're already in it. And then you're locked in for however long that consulting period is. Uh, and now you're having like slow implementation as a result of it or poor implementation because there's just a communication gap that's built into just the structure of the group itself. Um, another distinction that I think would be helpful uh, for anyone listening in is I, when it comes to the online world, we typically get help from what I call the four C's, you know, courses, coaching, consulting, and communities, you know, and then there's some kind of hybrid, you know, um, maybe of two, three, or even like four of them. But there's also another distinction that you and I have spoken about uh, very specifically. I've given a lot of thought to this, um, which is the distinction between courses and training. You've been very intentional about um, the components of one of your programs being the training, uh, the toolkit, and the tribe. Tell us about why each of those three things, because I know someone, whether you're leading a team of consultants or you're like a solo consultant, thinking through this level of specificity is something that's going to be helpful uh, for making sure that each person is clear on exactly what they're doing, why they're doing it. Yeah, absolutely. So. For me, the tribe is the people, the community, your coaches, consultants, um, decision makers, implementers, right? It's, it's all the stakeholders that are there to help you get results, right? And however, which way you want to format that, um, you know, that's definitely an art more than a science, I think, um, left up to each individual and like what, what their, what their people really need. So for me, I think that, and again, right, like I was thinking about like, how do I want to scale this during the pandemic where community was so important? And 
people really needed it. I mean, people always need community. Um, it's like there was a saying by someone, it's a sales guy, Brad. He used to say, he's like, it takes a village to raise a child. It takes a tribe to raise an entrepreneur, right? Like, and so um, that really stuck with me. And mm. so that's the tribe portion. Right? Like that's like, mm-hmm. how are the people going to help you reach results? Okay. Then there is the training. And for me, the training was really important to, to section it off as a course, because, you know, I had my, my own perceived, you know, feelings about this, but also because for me, it wasn't, it wasn't linear, right? Like a course usually is going to take you from A to Z um, in a very specific way. For for us, you know, like once we do a diagnostic with you, we build a roadmap, we want to map your training to that roadmap so that you can get results very quickly Mm. and different people in your organization might be able to take on different training in parallel or sequentially Uh. um, at different times. So, Mm. right. So there's the, the distinction of like who needs it when they need it how they need it right and so um for me the training was more like comparable to when you're in a large organization you have extended learning and development right so Mm -hmm. what are those um you know for some it's like oh you have to take uh development courses like we're not that specific but that was sort of the model that i was looking at i was like okay well your account managers need this your project manager needs that your sales people or whoever your sales implementation person needs this, right? So that's why I was really specific on training because it's a very team focused approach mm-hmm. um, as opposed to a course where it's like one person's taking the course soup to nuts and then they're trying to implement everything. Um, then the toolkits are what are those tangible things that we're giving to the clients to help them speed up the implementation, right? Whether they're, you know, for us, you know, it's like whether they're guides or templates or workflows, um, you know, spreadsheets, diagnostics, gap analysis, um, dashboards, and depending on where you are, those, those toolkits scale. Right. Like mm-hmm. sometimes like the toolkits are you're like, oh, you know, here's a basic toolkit because nowadays you can download a bunch of, you know, templates offline for free where people used to sell them. Now are like, oh, we're going to do this as a lead man. But, you know, the tools as your maturity gets. Higher, um, I think those toolkits become more, a lot more sophisticated. Right. So that scales, too. So. Yep. That's kind of how I think about like all of the different resources to really help um, my folks with their operations implementation. I there are multiple points here um, that I want to dive into. I'm going to circle back to the training because there's uh, some interesting stuff that you said in there um, that I I want to make sure that uh, we we don't uh, leave. in 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 the diamonds in the rough, I want to take those diamonds out, polish them a little bit, um, Mm -hmm. so that people uh, don't miss them, Uh, but. With even just a toolkit, uh, that's really, really important. And before I even say what I'm about to say is, if you're listening in, a piece of the context that you might not have is that what Juliana does is she helps digital marketing agencies scale through the $1 million, $3 million, and $7 million plateaus. And so if you're a consultant that's not yet at those plateaus or you're trying to get past them, like everything here is tested because again, it's, it's been done with like over 200 plus agencies. Right. And so that just really underlies the importance of what it is that we're sharing. Wait, did you say 500? Yeah. Yeah. We've, we've gone up since our marketing materials. (laughs) I don't have words. I'm a words guy and I don't have words. Yeah. So um, that's amazing. Um, We will definitely be updating the podcast show notes. (laughs) That for sure. Uh, That's awesome. Um, so yeah, 500 tested with 500 plus agents and you have an extremely robust network, a really robust method for being able to, uh, diagnose, um, uh, the, the business operations of anybody that comes in across like five areas and I forget like how many, how many questions you ask in like the onboarding survey and it takes them like 20 minutes to like get it done. Right. It used to take them 20 minutes and then 
um, we've, you know, I'm all about the throughput, right? I'm like, ah, oh, how do we get the same answers faster? Now it takes them five to seven minutes. So I'm very awesome. excited about this. So, <laughs> so like that is amazing. And all of that's to say is that the toolkit that we were just talking about is applicable. That concept is applicable at those levels of scale. And so like, if you're wanting to be able to ensure that you have high quality outcomes, then that is one of the components that you're going to be wanting to pay attention to. And particularly for consultants, you know, other people in like the online course world and stuff, um, the toolkit could be very simple, but consultants, like it tends to be mental models that we have taken five plus years of like working through to, for it to be hyper efficient, for it to be able to have handle volume, high quality, all this stuff to architect this particular result um, in like a, a very environments that have legal ramifications if you get it wrong. Um, and also serious financial implications and stuff for a business. And so like this stuff, like, like the word toolkit in the copywriting world just doesn't sound like all that exciting, but it's significant is the point that I'm underlying. Um, and then to circle back to the uh, training uh, that we were talking about earlier, something that I know that you've done is like you've segmented the training across like, you know, of like five different core like topic areas that um, are necessary for implementing like effective uh, business systems. But this thing that you said in there that I wanted to underline uh, was the thinking through of who needs to take it uh, and what they need to know so that people could be training in parallel on different things. And what my mind translated that to uh, for for anyone that might not be listening in that doesn't have a background in corporate, like for instance, my background is in uh, academia science, uh, and so like I didn't have the context of like the corporate world and structures and like how to think about this stuff, and I just had to kind of learn it all as I go went along. Um, but one way of also thinking through this is what you've done is you've created custom learning paths based on the diagnostic tool that you created. And so the diagnostic tool, it sounds like, assesses the organization as a whole, as well as what the individuals and stuff are going to need. And then now you've got a custom pathway through the bigger you know, um, uh, a training library uh, that you have to be able to increase the capability of each person within the context of their role and within the context of them working together. Is that about right? Yeah, that's perfectly said. Okay, cool. You are good with words. Um, <laughs> All right. Mike, check. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Thank you for that. <laughs> You're good. I, was like, I was like, oh shit, we lost. Some <laughs> I, like, I, think I, I think I got so excited about what you were sharing and then I like hit the mic and then I disconnected it. I think that's uh, what happened. <laughs> so, so yeah, I just really wanted to make sure that we underline that point because I know from my own context of having worked with consultants and teams of consultants, what it's like as a solo consultant trying to understand context that you don't necessarily have the background for, and also uh, someone who's already further along in the journey, but they haven't thought through to this level of detail, but they're wanting the outcome, which is high impact, not just some high margin thing, but having a high impact on the transformational experience that they want to craft for the humans that they are trying to help because the program or productized offer or whatever container it is that they decide to put it in is really just amplifying their service-based values, which was, again, being of service to the people to help them live a better life. Um, yeah, absolutely. That said, uh, Let's talk about robots. Um, so, yay for <laughs> for either for either. Uh, so, I'm curious. Um, this is going to be a little bit speculative. We've, we've been going deep down the rabbit hole of you know, okay, you know, strategy, tactics, and everything on productizing offers, consulting. Um, let's step a little bit into the future. What kind of impact do you think uh, OpenAI, ChatGPT three, and whatever it is to come? is going to have on even, let's just say, business operations. Well, Mark, you know that we have to be nice to the robots, right? <laughs> they will take over the world. <laughs> and they're also listening on this call. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's why we have to be nice to them. Um, so right now, 
um, chat GPT. We've got Google's um, Bert. Bard, ben, I think. Bert. Bard, or is yes. that is that Microsoft's? I know Bard um, is one of the names. Microsoft, yeah, mm-hmm. so we have Microsoft, right? So so we've got a bunch of stuff coming out. Um, right now, I think this is my current feeling, right? Mm-hmm. As it is February 2023, and this mm-hmm. might change in the future. Um, <laughs> my current feeling, I like just for the snippet. My current feeling on on the robots is that they are like mediocre employees. Okay. Um, they still need a lot of supervision. You don't necessarily know whether the stuff is true or not. Um, and they act like they're highly confident. Okay. So, um, (laughs) so it's like quality control still needs to be there. Um, it's, it's like a mediocre employee. You're like, Oh, you think they're great. But then you got to like review their work and you're like, ah, crap. I'm still quality assuring your ass. Um, so that is how I feel about the bots. I think it's they're extremely helpful in certain mm-hmm. areas. And I think what's important is to understand what each bot purposes. Mm-hmm. So, for example, when Alexa versus Google Home, you know, came out, right? Because those those are the two biggest players, right? Like I I got Alexa first, and I was just like, it doesn't seem to understand me. Like for whatever reason, like I couldn't do the props, right? Like, like the prompt mm-hmm. response was not working for me. Um, and, but Google was like doing it, right? Like I tested both. And so, and then I was like, well, yeah, of course, like, Google's algorithm is so much better. You know, it's got NLP. Da, da. And then, and for reference also, my fiance is a data scientist, right? So like, we're talking about bots of all sorts of levels all day long, right? Where he's like geeking out on the internal infrastructure of the neural language processing. And I'm just like, oh dear. Um, <laughs> so, so it gets real geeky in the household. Um, now, what Alexa has done really well and what it's really good at is talking to other machines in your household. So if you have a household that's full of, you know, Amazon stuff that you're like, Oh, I want my fridge. And like now my, you know, robot vacuum and the thing that plays music to all talk to each other. So I can just, you know, like command at the house. That's, that's what you need, right? Like go for that. Um, So with all of these AIs, it's figuring out like, what are they good at and what are they not so good at? Mm -hmm. So you're not driving yourself nuts, I think. So AI, a mediocre uh, employee um, that is also overconfident. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> overconfident <laughs> mediocre point. It's like someone right out of college. Mediocrity. <laughs> yeah, it's like someone like right out of college. That that's basically what that is. <laughs> like, I mean, it increases your capacity, but there's so much supervision. Like oh man. That's that's, great. that's how I feel. <laughs> <laughs> A hundred percent. I've been doing um, uh, uh, no shortage of internal testing. And just even this morning, I've looked at some of the output uh, that it created. And it's just, okay, apparently I just need to keep the mic far enough away from myself because I am destroying it, <laughs> apparently. Apparently you're, <laughs> you're, you're overzealous and killing the mic. This is yeah, the best podcasting a- compliment I've ever gotten. Is, um- <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Oh, um, so overconfident mediocrity. Um, is, is, is where we're at with AI. Um, it's fantastic. Uh, double check the work. And so it, it's fascinating to me though, because what it requires, uh, is for us to do or become much stronger at something, which, uh, a skill that you're really good at. And, um, I've seen you coach many business owners at, which is basically managing you know, because it's like, you have to prompt, you have to direct, you have to evaluate, you have to critique, you quality assure the work, give feedback to have it improve. You know, the iteration cycles might be a little bit faster, but it's still like a little bit of the meta, same meta process uh, uh, for doing that. And so let's say, actually, no, this is applicable for whether or not someone's a solo consultant and whether or not they're leading like a team of consultants. Like, how do you think through being a very effective 
manager? How do you help people to become better at that? So I think the, the first thing to becoming a better manager is to manage as less as possible. <laughs> um, I would say yeah. that, um, you know, I think step one is create as many systems and processes. And I know I'm like very biased. However, um, like when I started my journey, like I got really good at systems and processes because I didn't want to manage. I didn't know how to manage. I was like, I was 23 managing groups of like 50 to 70. And I had no idea what I was doing. I was like, let me hack this. Um, so I still think that if you can manage less, um, that's your first step, right? So that the management that you are doing is really quality and you can focus on the actual training and developing and coaching of people as opposed to just the, um, like what feels to many consultants as the day-to-day -day management, right? So it's like answering the million questions a day, um, making sure that they're trained up, doing the quality assurance, right? So like if you can create systems so that you have training, you have SOPs, you have, um, you know, things that are there to guide individuals and the outcomes that you want for your organization, then you can do less of that, right? Like you're, you're less of a walking SOP and more of a person that's going to develop and increase the performance of individuals. And so step one, do as little management as possible so that you can spend quality time. Step two, really work on, um, like the communication that you have to have people improve uh, faster and better, right? I think that the better you can communicate as a manager, because um, even though you're speaking English to English or whatever language to, you know, the exact same language, so many things get lost in translation, yeah. right? Because people you know, cause human are going to human, right. They're going to have emotions and they're going to have feelings and they take feedback differently and you give feedback differently. And the way that you may communicate may not be the way that they receive communication. So I think communication is huge. Um, and I also think establishing a culture, right. So like understanding what your values are, um, as an individual and how they extend into your business, right. Understanding your organization's values and then hiring for those values, is also going to do a massive lift in your management, right? Cause if you can share values, um, you can, you can fail a lot at the other things, right? Like, you're like, yeah. Oh man, I didn't communicate really well on that time. Like, mm -hmm. I screwed that up. Right. But you know, we, we have a shared, like we have shared values, you know, we have a shared outcome. Like I can come back and clean that up. Yep. Right. So, um, I think having good systems and processes, like having, clear values and hiring for that. And then working on communication, um, is going to really give you that 80, 20 of what management is. Um, I appreciate that plug. Thank you. Um, it's great. Yeah. The 80, 20, um, <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I, had no. to, I had to throw it in somewhere, right? Yeah. Because <laughs> like so much of management is communication, right? I think mm -hmm. I had done, um, an exercise with, with one of our HR experts, um, Eileen's, and we came up with like 27 different management conversations that managers are having at any mm -hmm. one given time. And if you're a consultant who just hired someone, guess what? You're the manager. Um, you know, it's everything from onboarding conversations to, um, feedback conversations to performance improvement plans to, um, offboarding conversations to stay, uh, interview. Like there's just, there's so much of it that is spent in communication that, you know, I think, having that as, as both a practice and as a capability is huge. So there's multiple threads in here. Um, and I had to pull back cause I almost hit the mic just now, but um, <laughs> there's, <laughs> there's uh, what I'm hearing are some themes within this of uh, consultants needing to see themselves as not just consultants, but founders as entrepreneurs, as managers as well, and ultimately leaders, 
You know, there's there's these unspoken roles um, that we need to be aware of and also know and own um, in the evolution of the business model, whether or not we're going with the let me scale by growing the team or productizing, you know, my offers um, or a combination of both. Um, that's that's something of what I'm hearing uh, in here. Another thing that happened maybe like a couple minutes ago, it was a throwaway comment on your part, but I could hear like the audience just like screaming, hold up, pause, wait a minute. Like you said you were managing teams of how many people at like 23? What, what, yeah, that, what, what oh. what's that? <laughs> what is that? So when, when I left Wall Street, right, because I didn't want to look at operating models and financial spreadsheets for 16 hours a day, um, I went into sports and entertainment. And the gig was, right, it was like, all right, Juliana, you are going to, you know, go into a new city, go to a hiring fair, interview 100 people a day, you know, create your team of 50 to 70, usually, per event. And events were like Super Bowl, Ryder Cup, USCA tennis, right? These were the events. Um, then you're going to go and train people across usually like one mile or, you know, two kilometer arenas, right? Where resources were completely dispersed. Um, I would get there. People were like, who's the manager? It's like, me. I look like I was 13. Um, and then go manage and operate a million dollars a week. That was the gig, right? Pick you up, throw you, drop you in a new city every six to eight weeks. That was the gig. And, <laughs> and I was wild. like, <laughs> and no, it was, it was a crazy <laughs> ride, right? Like I was like, I got my, you know, operations training wheels in this. Like I did not know how to manage people. Like I totally like got myself a gig and I had never really managed people. And so it was, it was crazy. Right. But I was just like, I could do it. I'll figure it out. Um, and so for me, I was like, how do I, how do I hack this? Right. That's always like, how do I hack this? Um, and I was like, I need to manage less. Like that was my sole objective was to manage less. Cause I didn't know how to manage. So I was like, in order to manage less, I need to train faster and I need to hire better. So that became my mantra, like manage less, train faster, hire better. I like it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's because there's the bigger theme of removing oneself as the bottleneck and making it so efficient that like, it's going to work like no matter what uh, happens, uh, which happens to be an excellent way for creating a self-managing company. Um, like just because <laughs> ultimately you're trying to pull yourself out um, of the operating equation uh, and then the business equation uh, altogether, you know. Um, uh, so, so like I, I love that, uh, and that was like day zero or like before, you know, um, uh, doing what it is that you're doing now. Uh, and I'm curious uh, because you said that you weren't good at people would you still say that has it changed oh no absolutely not like i mean i've learned so much in the last 20 years um and you know from from starting operations and from that gig um like now like i love i would say developing people hmm. like you know um and really being able to take them from like here to here. Right. So, you know, they're starting in with X capabilities and being able to see them grow, um, empowered, making decisions, um, feeling confident over those decisions, um, getting promoted. Like it's, it's one of my favorite things to see someone like, you know, go through a career track and just absolutely like crush it. I mean, that's a massive shift. And I, I'm imagining that some people, there's going to be people who are on like both ends of the spectrum, people who are just like, yeah, I love it. I'm all about the people and other people, the, mm, the people, how, how do you make that transition? Like what, what even sparked like the change? 
Um, I think it's just, it's practice, right? So it's like, I didn't want to manage. I was trying to manage as little as possible, but I still had to manage something, right? Like, like I still had to manage. I still had to deal with people, right? And so it's just with, with every gig, with every, you know, endeavor, with every, you know, job, like it, I just got better at it um, and figured out like, okay, well, what do people need? What, you know, it's just like any sort of capability. Um, just trained myself up to be able to train others up. Um, took a lot of courses, took a lot, you know, both business and personal development and communication, um, increased my own capability and was able to see results in others. And I think that's, you know, like any leader. So you, you said the key word there, right? Uh, leader, um, and by extension leadership and, the other theme within what you just shared uh, that I'm hearing is like a little bit of Carol Dweck's, you know, uh, fixed mindset versus growth mindset. It sounded like you had a very clear growth mindset, like, oh, I can become better. I can learn, you know, and I know that we share a heavy interest in not just um, like personal development, but like also uh, professional development as well. Why is it? that some folks, well, let me rephrase this question. What is the hardest part about growing oneself and also hardest part about getting your team to grow? Um, so, <laughs> I think the hardest part about growing itself is, you know, that like uh, that diagram that's like, you know, that they always show in socials where it's like, you know, this is your comfort zone. This is outside of the comfort mm -hmm. zone. This is where growth happens, yep. right? Like, well, guess what? Where growth happens, fucking sucks. Um, <laughs> it sucks. Like, like I don't think people talk about like how not fun growth is, right? Like, mm. um, like, like personal growth is. Like, it's not only like uncomfortable, it's hard. Like, it's really hard, right? Um, and at different points in time, too, like where you're like, oh, yeah, I learned that lesson. You know, that was great. And then 10 years later, like, smacks you over the head. And you're like, ah, oh, great. I have to relearn that. <laughs> um, it's like, yes, I didn't fully learn it. Um, and like, it's just, I think it's, you know, I mean, like the saying that ignorance is bliss, like there's a reason for that. Like, um, like, yeah, self-awareness is not fun sometimes. Um, I mean, it's great, you know, like in the overall scheme of, you know, Maslow's hierarchy, yada, 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 um, self-enlightenment and all that jazz. However, like going through it is hard. Um, and so with the awareness that growth is hard, <laughs> right? Like now have your team go through growth, right? Like mm -hmm. you're asking them to stretch. Um, and, and we're going to go back to the, I'll, I'll comment on the management thing, right? Like, although mm -hmm. I do enjoy like, you know, creating leaders and all that, like there are days where I'm not at my best, where I'm like, Oh my God, I do not want to deal with this person's emotion. And I'm gonna have to calibrate my communication so that I don't kill them. Um, <laughs> And so like, you know, it's, it's a day-to-day -day endeavor. Like, you know, it's not like you wake up and you're like, oh my God, I'm a magical manager. No, um, that's not the case. So those are my thoughts on, on growth. And, you know, this is coming from like a self-proclaimed, like personal development learn. Like I love, um, I don't know, maybe I'm a glutton for punishment, but like, I love what development does, right? Like I love mm. the outcomes of it. It's, um, it's very similar to traveling. Like I actually, like, I love getting to the destination, right? The destination is amazing. And, you know, maybe there's like cultural learning or maybe there's a phenomenal beach or a great hotel or whatnot. Right. But getting on a plane for, you know, X amount of hours to get there. I don't love the travel of it. Like don't love it. You know, if I could just teleport my way there, like I would be happy. Um, that's that's not an option yet but that that's kind of how i feel about growth and if we have a clear outcome we will march you know towards it 
Um, uh, and that's in big three areas of life, health, wealth, and love. Mm -hmm. I saw a little thing. And so I thought maybe you were going to add something there. Mm -hmm. No, I was just thinking about the, the, the SEO that I was learning this morning that I did not want to be learning. <laughs> that's what I was thinking. <laughs> I was like, it's like, this is treacherous. <laughs> oh. Mm -hmm. And I was like, but I am very much focused on owned media this year. <laughs> mm -hmm. That is my outcome. We have traction. Let's keep going. Um, it, stop, it, stop. It, it, it was me this morning in the gym. And <laughs> I have these exercise bands. Like, like we're talking the heavy mm -hmm. duty bands that can bear yeah. your entire weight. And I have yes. that strapped around my legs and I'm on the leg press thing. And I'm like going for the deepest squat possible, basically. And I'm like, mm -hmm. I hate life right now. But on the other side of this is growth. Like when yes. like, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to come back and be better at this next week, you know? Uh, <laughs> yeah. So a hundred percent. A little bit of a, a topic jump for you. Um, this is also something that I know has um, brought uh, a lot of great joy uh, to your life uh, and mine as well. Um, food. If you had to make a recommendation for a consultant that is looking for a bit of a dopamine high halfway through the day when they're trying to, they're trying to make it through, you know, and they've been having these like difficult client calls and it's just like, mm, and, and they just, they just need like a quick pick me up. Like what's, what's like a go-to. Hmm. In the middle of the day. So I'm, I'm trying to be like inclusive here. Right. Cause I'm like, ah, Don't. are they <laughs> like, <laughs> um, okay. So all right, so I'm gonna be honest. All right. I have bougie snacks. Okay. okay. Like I don't no, snack a lot. Like I don't snack a lot, but they're the bougie. Um <laughs> so um so I, I I ration them. Um so I will so the middle of the day, uh prosciutto is a good one because right. you know it's a protein plus fat. I like doing protein plus fat in the middle of the day. Hmm. Um why? Prosciutto's one, because uh, it fits with my macros, and I'm that person. Okay. <laughs> I am as well. Uh, yes. Um, so the, the other one that I have been really liking, um, and it's not like as readily accessible, but there's these things called Ella's Crackers. And so there are these seed crackers and they're like low calories. Um, I don't, I think they have like three grams of carbs or something like that. And so, and they're crunchy. They're so crunchy. So if you're like looking for, it's almost like a, and, and I've had a lot of seed crackers and they usually taste like cardboard. Um, I'm not like about the seed crackers usually, but these it's like, they took all of the everything season for the bagels and then turned it into a cracker. Mm. I'm like, Oh, and so, so I'll take that and, you know, put something, you know, like a piece of cheese or, um, or sometimes like duck pate. Cause you know, we're, we're on that thread. Um, so that gives me my fat and protein thing for the day. Uh, yeah, that's. I, Those I are like my it. snacks. <laughs> I like it. I like it. I'm, I'm pretty sure people are adding some stuff to their, uh, you know, mm -hmm. um, their 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 Instacart right now. Um, mm -hmm. Other question: What's going on with the huge shiny gong behind you? Oh, I don't think you can hear it, but oh, um, I would say it, it didn't pick it up. It didn't pick it up. But for yeah, anyone that's on, listening, uh, the gong Hold just on. got like a bang. Oh, it still didn't pick it up. Ah, uh, yeah, that's okay. Um, it only does it when it wants to. So, um, so in our community, whenever someone uh, you know has a big win, we have a channel called Gongs, um, so that people can energetically ring the gong, um, and you know, and that's how we sort of classify our wins in the community. So I have um, even our consultants will have like small like singing bowls. 
and we will like, you know, ring them for when people are, you know, like doing their wins. Cause I'm very big on the fact that we need to celebrate our wins so that we don't go into the capability, like the dopamine gap of like, Oh no, I'm just like, you know, in the gap of I've done all these accomplishments, but I can't even take a moment to celebrate them because I'm on to the next thing. So, um, you know, huge on the celebrations. And I was in Nepal in January and I was like, Oh my God, I can buy like these huge gongs that are usually very expensive. If you buy them in the U S so, um, I brought back some gongs, um, nice. so that we can actually ring them in real life. Oh, I could. Yeah. You know, and, yeah. and, you know, we'll get your Yeti mic to cooperate, you know, so that the rest of the world can experience more of the gong uh, awesomeness, you know, yeah. a little slice of their own gong channel uh, going. Um, and I also know that you have a hard stop. And so like, there's just like maybe two more questions that I have for you All right. um, before you go. And I just also want to say I'm extremely thankful for everything that you've shared uh, here today. There are nuggets here that I know that people are going to be able to come back to for years to come. That's not an exaggeration. Like I, I know the learning journey uh, for consultants, and there is a wealth of information that has been shared. Especially if you take the time to re-listen, apply it. Um, this, this, yes. So thank you um, for that. Um, I truly believe this is going to be uh, transformative for the right person. If you could go Yay. back in time. Back to finance, Juliana, what advice would you give her knowing everything that you know now? Finance, um, like, leave, leave now. <laughs> um, this, this, um, I think I would say uh, to really embrace failure. You know, um, failure is feedback. Failure is not failure. Um, failure is only failure when you give up. So I think that, you know, I, if I had embraced that, I would have started my business faster. Um, I would have, you know, built confidence earlier. I think I would have made different decisions when I had started the business as opposed to trying to get it right. Um, I'm not even talking about getting it perfect. Although, you know, probably there's some of that. Um, but I think, you know, just really being in an experimentive like mode, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's just like create and iterate, create and iterate, um, is what I would give myself mm -hmm. as advice. I like it. And before we wrap, where can we find out more about you? Yeah. So I actually am going to put some resources in scale time slash podcast slash modern. Um, because like, you know, I think growing a service-based business as we've talked about is really hard. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if we're really thinking through, you know, scaling that business, um, it doesn't have to be that hard, especially if people have done it, um, before you. Right. And, um, so I put in some resources in there. If you join the newsletter, um, you get like three months of like quick actions for quick wins that will make a huge operational impact. Uh, so, you know, definitely sign up there. And then the diagnostic that we spoke about, you can definitely see, you know, over 50 operational gaps in five minutes. We'll send you some fancy results. You can take a look at that, uh, figure out what systems you can put in place so that you can manage less as we've talked about. And, you know, if anything resonated, you just want to like chat about it, then I'm happy to hop on a call. So that is scale time slash podcast slash modern. Thank you so much uh, for being so kind, so generous. Uh, and thank you uh, for coming to the Modern Consultant. Well, thank you for having me. This was so much fun. Hey. Thanks for checking out the show. If you liked it, go ahead and hit the like button and also subscribe so you don't miss another one. It also tells us which ones that you like the most so that we can then do more interviews like that. If you want to go from idea to implementation, though, especially if you're wanting to productize your expertise so that you can scale your impact on your clients and, of course, grow your business, 
then join our email list. There we're going to talk about how modern consultants can productize their expertise so that they can have a greater impact on the world around them and live life on their terms. If that's up your alley, I hope to see you on the other side. Talk soon.